Hey everyone, welcome to Holly's Bookmark. I'm Holly. Uh, before I start my review, I just wanted to say something really quick. I know that my past reviews have been more um, summary than review, and so I'm going to try to be working on that. <laughs> this will be my first video where I'm working towards being better about uh, having more of a review than a summary. Uh, so thank you for sticking with me. Please bear with me. I'm trying. I'm adjusting. So this is the test one. We'll see how it works out. So today we'll be talking about Number Nine Dream by David Mitchell. This is a book about a 19 turned 20 year old boy man <laughs> named Aegi and he leaves his uh, country hometown on an island off of Japan to go to Tokyo in search for his father who abandoned him and his family. Eiji's mother is an alcoholic who also ended up abandoning her family a little later and Eiji's twin sister Anju uh, passed away when they were 11. So while Eiji is starting his new life in Tokyo, he daydreams a lot. These daydreams or fantasies range from getting up the courage to talk to his lawyer about where his father is in a cyberpunk futuristic world to him being the hero in a sudden flash flood that takes over Tokyo. Later, his fantasies seem to be more about him working through events that happen to him while he's in Tokyo. I feel like I'm saying Tokyo a lot, Tokyo, 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 so I'm sorry. At first I found the fantasies to be very cut and dry. You knew when Eiji was uh, daydreaming or fantasizing versus Eiji's real life. Later, as Eiji's life becomes more crazy with hackers, the Yakuza, and a sudden love interest, the lines between fantasy and reality become blurred for us, the reader. Like, even now, there are parts of the book that I don't know if they were reality or fantasy. This is certainly a coming-of-age novel in a surrealist way, which I think is more fun and kind of tilts uh, the average coming-of-age novel on its side a little bit. There are a lot of metaphors about uh, becoming an adult and like what is coming an adult, and he even uh, thinks about that himself. And um, there are literal ways to <laughs> age -y becoming an adult, such as like he's turning 20, which is a big deal in Japan, and that's kind of like when you become an adult and he also uh, loses his virginity on his 20th birthday and that those are like things that I think a lot of people maybe not a lot but some people signify of like kind of turning over from childhood to adulthood in a way and I really liked that because while there were definite like coming of age maybe uh, like tropes I guess um, I think there were a few that uh, I haven't personally seen before that make the book feel less cliche. Like I said before, there is a lot of wordplay and metaphors and some I obviously uh, understood or enjoyed and there are probably quite a few that went right over my head. I think this is one of those books that I could read a few times and still discover new meanings about and I really like that. And I probably will come back to it in a few years and explore it again versus maybe some other books where it's like, no, I I'm, I'm satisfied with that, that one read. This book, to me, uh, offers up two big comparisons <laughs> to other novels. The first one is, this book reminded me a lot of If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, the book I just reviewed last week. This wasn't planned. I read these in a order of like the way my book list was. I had no idea that they were similar in a way in context. Um, if you've watched my If on a Winter's Night review slash plot overview, um, it's back and forth between reality and reading a chapter of a different book every other chapter. In Number Nine Dream, there are nine chapters and they don't switch chapter wise like If on a Winter's Night did. It's kind of just interwoven into paragraphs, but you go back and forth between fantasy and reality, fantasy and reality, fantasy and reality. In two instances, it's not a fantasy or daydream, it's um, AEG reading something. So there's a children's novel that he reads and then a diary of a Japanese World War II soldier. It does have the similar pattern, but they were different enough for me that um, it, it wasn't 
like, oh no, <laughs> I'm doing this again. I did find myself having the same issue I had with if, On a Winter's Night a Traveler, where towards the end of the book, I was getting fatigued of the back and forth <laughs> of narrative fantasy, narrative fantasy. Uh, and I was just, I just wanted the narrative because it definitely comes to a head and you're just like, okay, okay, come on. Like, I just, I want to read about Aegi. I want to read about uh, his broken relationship with his mother, his father, um, him grieving his sister still, his new love interest that's starting to peak. You know, there was a, there's a lot going on. And then you're interrupted by, you know, the children's novel or the World War II diary. So it, it was kind of around the same time on both novels, I was starting to drop off where I was like, okay, narrative only, please. Also, weirdly enough, I found this when I was researching If On A Winter's Night A Traveler. In the Wikipedia, there's a quote from David Mitchell, actually, and it says, author David Mitchell described himself as being magnetized by the book from its start when he read it as an undergraduate. But on rereading it, he felt it had aged and that he did not find it breathtakingly inventive as he had the first time. Yet does stress that however breathtakingly inventive a book is, it is only breathtakingly inventive once, with once being better than never. I don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting. While he's obviously not copying If On A Winter's Night, like at all, it does have a similar idea to it. So I couldn't find anything else on David Mitchell and Italo Calvino, but I do think he was inspired by it for sure. Even if that Wikipedia quote is kind of like, eh, it's great, I, I guess, once. <laughs> the second comparison that you will come across quite a bit with this novel is how similar it is to Haruki Murakami's work in general, more specifically Norwegian Wood. Now I have read a few Murakami novels. I have not read Norwegian Wood. I know that's probably like, one of the top ones of Murakami. I don't know why I haven't read it, but there is a lot of comparison. I do see the comparisons between Number Nine Dream and Murakami's work in general, with it being, you know, a surreal kind of coming of age, young person story in Tokyo. And while of course they're not the same, you can definitely see it. And I, I uh, didn't have a problem with it personally. Some people are kind of prickly about it <laughs> in a way. Uh, some people, this book inspired them to read Murakami and vice versa. That's probably for every individual to judge <laughs> how they feel about it themselves. I do think David Mitchell played up the Murakami comparison. This is David Mitchell's second novel, I believe. I don't know if his first novel was compared to Murakami 2 and then he was just like, well, <laughs> if you're gonna say I'm like him, then I'm gonna amp it up because uh, at one point, A.G. has a dream about talking to John Lennon and he asked John Lennon what these certain songs mean. Two of the songs he asked about are Norwegian Wood and Number Nine Dream. In the dream, John Lennon tells A.G. that Number Nine Dream is the descendant of Norwegian wood. Take that as you will. I think that's a big old elbow, elbow, wink, wink kind of <laughs> nod to Norwegian wood, the novel, and saying, yeah, there's a lot of similarities, but there's also not, but there is a, a connection. I also found this, <laughs> I thought it was funny, uh, thing that someone said on Reddit when I was researching Number Nine Dream. Uh, it says, thought Number Nine Dream was a surprisingly compelling white dude Murakami impersonation. And if, if you look into it, you will see uh, that sentiment a lot. Speaking of John Lennon, if you watched my January TBR video, you will know that when I talked about Number Nine Dream, I was uh, wondering if it had anything to do with the John Lennon song Number Nine Dream or John Lennon in general and the number nine, like where does that all come into play? AEG is definitely obsessed with John Lennon and the Beatles. He uh, is listening to music a lot. He is constantly playing John Lennon or the Beatles. He plays guitar, he plays all John Lennon songs on his guitar and um, Beatles and John Lennon lyrics are inserted into the narrative. And it's only a couple of times, which I'm really thankful for because I think that can go cheesy or too much really fast. Honestly, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. I think if it was used more, I would be like, no, we're not, we're not doing this. <laughs> 
For the number nine, there is a possibility that John Lennon was obsessed with the number nine. I'm not going to get into that, but this also applies to the novel in a way, and that's probably where David Mitchell got his inspiration to insert nine in a lot of things. So there's that like weird connection there. The number nine shows up in a lot of places in this novel. I'm not going to go through them all, but just as an example, obviously times of day, hours in between events, years in between events, the number of letters in people's names. Those are just examples of where <laughs> the number nine pops up. I think it's pretty constant, just like how I talked about the metaphors in this book that probably went over my head. There are probably a bunch of number nine references that completely went over my head. I saw someone had kind of made a list and it blew me away <laughs> at how much nine references there are that I completely did not see at all. So I think if you're into that kind of thing, it could be kind of fun to uh, dive deeper into the number nine symbolism and where it is everywhere. It's kind of like a little scavenger hunt. Another thing I liked about this book was AEG goes through a lot of high, high and low lows. And there are, uh, you know, a lot of asshole characters around. And maybe it's just what I've been reading lately, but I've been reading a lot of novels where there are just so many jerks and it starts to get to you. <laughs> And so of course there are jerks in this book because, you know, they exist in the real world. But there are a lot of people that come through for AEG and a lot of people maybe you think wouldn't come through. And it was really heartwarming to me. Like when things started rolling, you know, after maybe like half of the novel, there are so many people ready to support him and care for him in their own weird, like, ways like some are obviously more subtle than others some are very uh just plain you know and out in the open and i really liked that because aeg like i said goes through so many lows and you you root for him so hard as a character like he's very likable you just want him to be okay and so when these when these people you know throughout the novel come through for him it's just it's really satisfying and it's really heartwarming. And I think it was something I needed at the time I read this. <laughs> so just like if on a winter's night a traveler, I give number nine dream four stars. I actually really liked it. The descriptions of Tokyo and the citizens of Tokyo and the way that Tokyo is like this like breathing monster in a way was really captivating. The characters are all over the place and interesting. There's a lot of different types of people. At first was confused, but I ended up really enjoying uh, not knowing if I was in a fantasy or reality. When the lines would get blurred, it was very intriguing to me. I think the way it's written, you can look at this novel as hopeful. It kind of depends, I think, where you are when you read this possibly. But like if on a winter's, tra if on a winter's night a traveler, it's such a mouthful. Um, I was fatigued by the back and forth fantasy reality. I just wanted to read the narrative plot. <laughs> towards, you know, like the last hundred pages. I was like, I, I just wanted to throw it away and just focus on AG and what was going on with him at that time. All right, quick stats. Number Nine Dream was published in 2001. It is fiction literature. It's set in Japan, mainly in Tokyo, and is 418 pages. Thank you for joining me on this review of Number Nine Dream. Please join me next time when I believe I'll be posting a three book vlog. We'll see how that works out. I like legit haven't looked at the footage, so I don't even know if there's, if it like looks good or if there's sound or anything. <laughs> see everyone next time.